Hello, my name is Kelsey Olson and I have the pleasure of serving as the Deputy Secretary of the Kansas Department of Agriculture. Welcome to the sixth annual Agricultural Summit on Agricultural Growth. I appreciate you taking your time today to join us for the discussion about animal health. Although this year's main Ag Growth Summit event will be held in person in Manhattan in August, we've decided once again to host our sector breakout sessions online in hopes to allow for wider participation of people from across the state. After all, it is your involvement that is key to the success of this event and key to the success of the Kansas agriculture industry. The strength of Kansas agriculture comes from your hard work, dedication and leadership, all of which have made it the state's largest industry and economic driver. The purpose of the summit is strategic industry growth and that requires communication, coordination and collaboration. Thank you today. Thank you again for taking your time out of your day today to be a part of this effort and participating in the animal health sector. I'll now turn this webinar over to the sector lead, Russell Plashka. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Olson. And welcome everybody. I am Russell Plashka with the Division of Ag Marketing at the Kansas Department of Agriculture and wanna thank you sincerely for taking time out of your lunch hour or however you're spending it with us today to be a part of this animal health sector session. So we're gonna spend the next hour or so on the animal health sector and really with the emphasis on the large and mixed animal practitioners across the state of Kansas and that, that part of the sector specifically today. But when we think about the animal health sector as a whole, you know, Kansas is located within that KC Animal Health Corridor, which is home to more than 300 animal health companies that account for over 56% of the total worldwide animal health diagnostics and pet food sales. According to the Kansas Department of Commerce, the Kansas bioscience industry employs over 16,000 across approximately 1,200 establishments with a heavy concentration in the animal agricultural feedstock, chemicals, and in research, testing, and medical labs. So no secret to a lot of people on this, this Zoom today, but Kansas, was also selected to be home for the National Agrobiodefense Facility, the state-of-the-art anti-biocontainment laboratory for the study of diseases that threaten both America's animal agriculture industry and the public's health. NBAF, which is nearing completion adjacent to K-State's campus, right in our backyard here at the Kansas Department of Agriculture, here in Manhattan will be fully operational in 2023. And this will strengthen the nation's ability to conduct research, develop vaccines, diagnose emerging diseases, and train veterinarians. The decision to locate NBAF in Kansas is further, co further confirmation that Kansas not only has a strong foundation and presence in the current animal health and bioscience sectors, but that the state's prominence in this critical sector of animal and human health will continue into the future. The vision of our agency is to provide an ideal environment for long-term sustainable agricultural prosperity and statewide economic growth. Our summit sector sessions provide that platform to entertain opportunities and barriers to the agriculture industry growth for our state. So with that, I do have a couple of housekeeping details. I know at this point, a lot of us are Zoom experts, but things do happen. So during the presentation portion, everybody will be muted. Um, at some point during our presentation, we will unmute for discussion. If you do have questions or if there are specific times that, hey, I really need some clarification on this, please put it in the chat. Dana Ladner here at the Department of Ag will be monitoring that chat and she will kind of notify our speakers that, hey, we do have a question here, let's stop for a second and address that. So we will be, we want this to be a very interactive and engaging activity and because there's a lot of great information that should be presented here today. With that, we will get into our agenda, and I would like to introduce Dr. Bonnie Rush. And most of you know Dr. Rush, the Dean of K-State College of Veterinary Medicine to bring greetings from the Vet College. Dr. Rush. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted you've joined us. And in looking at the RSVPs and the people on this call, uh, we were really pleased with the number of people with interest and pleased with the with a variety of backgrounds. There are, there are veterinarians, there are producers, there are, are people uh, who work in industry and, and um, we recognize that common shared concern that there are animals who cannot receive veterinary care uh, and practitioners who are tr having trouble hiring associates. And 
Uh, we are uh, attacking the problem in a multifactorial way. And uh, I'm really pleased with the, with the task force that uh, the approach that they've taken, and Brad's going to tell you about that, but I, I'm going to tell you about just one aspect of what we've done to make it uh, more affordable for graduates to stay in the state of, of Kansas. Um, so we froze tuition um, starting, uh, this will be the fifth year. We just, uh, we just froze it a month ago for the fifth time. And that is unprecedented. There, uh, you know, I don't know about in Bill Brown's era whether uh, tuition was frozen every year, um, or maybe even not Rick Tanner's, but certainly Clay Briner's year, uh, he experienced an increase in tuition every year he was in veterinary school. So in modern history, we had not frozen even for one year, and we froze in five years, and we eliminated about five thousand dollars in hidden costs for students through books, uh, fees, and supplies. And the outcome of that. Uh, you can see for a Kansan, door-to-door, -door, tuition is about $98,000 and has been. So the seniors that graduated never saw an increase in tuition, and the seniors that are about to graduate never saw an increase in tuition. We also have dramatically increased the scholarship distributions, and you can see the impact of the educational debt for an in-state Kansan graduating from, uh, from veterinary school. Out of state, uh, the, the tuition for an out of state student is $215,000 door to door. Uh, and you can see we have reduced it. 236 is still a huge number, um, but we have really taken, uh, made a dent in that particular educational debt. We continue to have an exceptional pass rate on the national board exam. Uh, new graduate employment on the morning of graduation uh, is 98%. And we knew within a week that it was 100% employment. Uh, most of our, our graduates have identified their employment destination by January of the year that they graduate. So when, when somebody comes to me in March and says, I really need a new graduate, you're really looking at somebody who's currently a junior uh, because the seniors all pretty much know where they're going at that stage. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brad White. Uh, he has led this task force. Uh, through a survey of producers to uh, determine what their needs are, both in um, accessing veterinarians and the types of care that, that would, they would like to access. So um, great to see all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Dr. White, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dr. Rush. I appreciate it. And I will start out and we're, we're going to have a discussion today. And I'll, I'll maybe frame that a little bit in saying that we want to be sure that that we have um, an opportunity. If you have questions, and and it was mentioned earlier, if you have questions, comments, things you want to, to jump in on, please do. I want to share, and I'm pretty excited to share because there's been a, a really good group that has kind of come together, and and I'll talk a little bit about it. And it's a good group with a a long name, the Rural Veterinary Workforce Development task force. So we, we came together and, and I wanted to share some of the information that this group has put together. And you'll notice there are quite a few different logos on this screen. And what you see is we have collaboration among both different areas of the university, as well as organizations within the state, such as Farm Bureau and KLA, the Livestock Marketing Association, KVMA, and then governmental agencies through the Kansas Department of Ag. And essentially, we all came to the table with similar goals of how do we understand the needs and challenges that face rural veterinarians. And a lot of this is led by, uh, and it was mentioned earlier, this is the sixth Kansas Ag Summit. Uh, in most of those I have been to, there, this has been a discussion area. What, what are our plans for developing more rural veterinarians? How do we keep them in areas of need? How do we make sure we serve the livestock producers of the state of Kansas? So from, from each of these groups, uh, we had people that came together and um, let, let me just put some names up here so that if you have questions, you can certainly contact any one of them. And, and we've had good representation uh, from across the board. And this is the team and we've had several meetings. We in fact started in February of 2020 and had, I looked up and putting this presentation together. So our second meeting date was scheduled to be March 20th, 2020. 
in which case that was right at the time when we uh, lots of things happened and changed. So we put that off, we ended up meeting again in the summer and then we've met several times since then. At each of these meetings, the discussion has been, okay, so we've got, the, we've got some people in the room that have different perspectives, different plans. What's our objective and goal for this group and what do we really wanna accomplish? And what we wrote out was, and, and hopefully everything I will share with you today helps get us a little bit closer to this objective and it is to, to promote the, both the development and retention of excellent veterinarians to ensure that we have long-term adequate supply of practitioners to serve our agricultural communities. So to accomplish that goal, we have to start out by thinking a little bit about what are some of the driving factors? What are some of the forces that influence whether we both develop or retain those practitioners? And then as we've talked before, uh, relative to veterinary shortages, I'm going to share with you the results of a study that we did here in Kansas of producers asking them about their perspective on a shortage. So our agenda for today, I wanted to set the stage a little bit and going through the process of what are some of the national factors that impact rural practice and then we'll hone in a little bit and we're going to talk about a couple things in Kansas. One, how are we doing our training development of veterinarians? Two, what are the large animal veterinarians in Kansas? What does that kind of look like in aggregate as a group, including where are they and how many are, how many are out there? Uh, and we've got some pretty cool information there to share. And then I'm going to wrap up by talking uh, about producer survey, the producer survey that I mentioned. So, but at any point, uh, stop me if there are questions, stop me if there's anything that, that you'd like to jump in and ask about. Dr. Rush mentioned student debt. She mentioned the change in our students' debt. Uh, in this chart, you can see uh, on the vertical axis, there's uh, dollars. And then the, on the red line, that represents the debt of students nationally. And the blue line, represents income and change in income. At a glance, you can see if we look over the last 20 years, and these numbers are from AVMA, the American Veterinary Medical Association. So a couple of things that are important there. One, this goes across all areas of veterinary medicine, and it goes across all regions of the country. And this blue line represents starting salary and the red line, student debt you notice right away the blue line is going up, certainly, but not nearly as significantly as the red line is increasing. So if we look in 2000, 2001, our starting salary was around 60 and the educational debt was around 70,000. Quick math, it's about a one-to-one -one ratio. Fast forward to 2018, your starting salary is around 75,000 and your educational debt's about 145,000 nationally, it's about a two to one ratio. So I think it's important to think about from new graduates as they're coming out, they have to figure out how they're gonna manage that and how they're gonna, ch how they're gonna change as they, as they go forward. The other thing that, that we talk about, uh, and this is a pretty interesting number from the AVMA too, uh, veterinarians entering into practice, and there's lots of different areas. I mentioned lots of different segments you can go to. So certainly uh, private practice has a variety of forms uh, based on the species often. Then there are governmental veterinarians. There are also people that go to colleges or universities, if you can imagine that. But there are folks that go into uh, other private businesses as well. What we see in starting new graduates, so this is right out of school, uh, about 14 and a half percent of them enter into large animal or mixed animal practice. Interestingly, if you look at what percent of veterinarians, so there's about 85, 90,000 veterinarians in the US, you look at what percent of veterinarians are large animal across all career stages, large or mixed animal, and it is a relatively small percent, it's around 8%. So certainly, even as a national trend, and this is important, you start at 14.5%, it's gonna decrease a little bit. This, these are national numbers. I'll show you some Kansas numbers here in just a minute. So when we talk about veterinary training here at K-State, I'm gonna focus this part of it on 
what are, what are we doing here within state, which will hopefully impact our development and retention of those, of those veterinarians. And I mentioned the national number, you see about 14% of students go into large animal practice. Here at K-State, we see about a quarter of our students that will enter into food animal practice. And we don't have great numbers on how many of them stay in food animal practice long-term, but we know we have uh, many good large animal practitioners here in Kansas. This number certainly goes up and down, but we have developed a core contingent of faculty that I think impacts how we can get some of those students that come here that really wanna do food animal, they really wanna do beef, they really wanna do cattle practice uh, or some other type of larger mixed animal practice. We don't produce very many that go out and only do large animal. We produce a lot more that would go into a mixed animal practice, even if they have a large animal focus. But so about a quarter of our students wanna do large animal, which on a national scale is huge. There are very few other veterinary schools that would have that many students interested in large animal medicine. We also have three programs that I wanna highlight just briefly and talk through and say, th these are programs that we put in place to kind of help with that development side of the equation. How do we develop these students? And, and we talk a lot about how can we get them ready to be practice ready day one? We know nobody's as ready day one as they are day 366, right? <laughs> After you've been out a year in practice. However, we wanna build the base so that they're as ready as possible. Couple of ways that we do that. One is the VTPRK program, the Veterinary Training Program for Rural Kansas. And I'm gonna talk more about it in a minute, but that's a program that allows those students to have a scholarship as they go through all four years in school. And then as they work in a rural practice, they stay in that practice for four years. A year of the loan is forgiven for each year that they stay in practice. Now, I would ask you to think about, we've been running that program for, for 15 years, just kind of put a number in your mind, how many of those, how often do you think that works? What percent of those students do you think stay in a rural area after they've been through that program? So I'm gonna show you the answer here in a minute, but I wanna briefly discuss the other two programs. So there's another one called the Food Animal Veterinary Certificate or FAVC. That program allows our students to focus themselves on food animal medicine by taking a series of electives and additional both uh, technical skills opportunities and te technical skills assessments. So the faculty assess if they're ready for food animal practice. And interestingly, that one by design does not add any cost for the students but it allows them to distinguish themselves in the food animal area. The SPARC program is one that Dr. Rost has started. She's uh, really done a great job with this one and it's a summer program for aspiring rural veterinarian, rural Kansas veterinarians. And in this program, it's students that are planning to apply to veterinary school and showing them some of the opportunities in veterinary practice. Last night, I had the opportunity to visit with some of those students. They had just got back, they took a trip all over Kansas and they were talking about the practices they visited from far Southwest Kansas to far Northwest Kansas. So I ask you on the VTPRK, how many of those you thought would stay in practice? And um, this is a map that shows where those VTPRK students have gone. So you certainly see a distribution across the state and this is over the last 15 years. And what we see is we've had 76 recipients, 97% of them have or are filling their obligations. After four years, we see that ni about 95% of them are still in a qualifying county, which a qualifying county is based upon a population threshold. And 77% of them, almost four out of five are still in the same practice that they started in, which is tremendous. This program has been very successful at putting practitioners in rural Kansas and hopefully setting them up for lifelong career success. If we compare that a little bit too, so the last bullet that I've got up there, there's actually a similar program at KU Med. So this program is funded by the state legislature. We have five slots per year. 
uh, so 20 slots total throughout the veterinary school. And when I say slot, that's the amount of funding we have to provide that scholarship through those four years. So we have 20 positions. Out of the last years that we've been doing this, most of the students, almost all, have fulfilled their obligation. If we contrast that with the KU medical program, also funded by the legislature, they have 120 slots in their program and only two thirds of those repay that program through service. The rest of them do what's called a buyout or they buy back their loan instead of uh, going through and going to rural Kansas. So I feel like, and I just put that up there only so that we have a comparison to say, man, this is, this is really getting some of, those, some of those students out there. So I wanna talk a little bit about, okay, so we talked about the VTPRK students, some of the development side, where are the large animal veterinarians in Kansas? And this is where the, the committee has really come together. So we've worked with the, we worked with the KVMA. We worked with, the, I'm gonna show you some, what I think are really cool graphs that were put together by Linda at, at the Department of Ag. We've had some great assistance as we looked in to both the economic side and thinking about what are the economic impacts of those veterinarians. But our committee has kind of come together and I'd ask you to think about as you picture the state. So picture the state of Kansas, where do you think most of the veterinarians are? And then I'll ask you to go one step further. And if you said oh, around Kansas City and Wichita, yes, you're right. So if I frame the question that way, where are most of the veterinarians? They're around Kansas City and Wichita and of course, Manhattan. But if we ask where are only the large animal veterinarians? So the numbers that I'm gonna show you are based on where are the large animal veterinarians? And this is based on uh, practice registries or practice uh, as these practices and they're classified as mixed or large animal or mobile. Now I'll say uh, we have about 446 veterinarians in the state of Kansas. Our mobile vets, uh, there's not that many of them, but they're not gonna show up as a dot on this map. So we look at this map and it's scaled. The bigger the dot, the more veterinarians there are in that area. Because we only have large animal practicing veterinarians, if we look here at Riley County or Manhattan, where we know there are a lot of veterinarians associated with the university, a lot of other veterinarians in town, we don't have a lot here because we don't have a lot of large animal practicing veterinarians. We certainly see that there's increased density if we took the state and divided it and looked at the eastern half. The eastern half of the state has a higher density of veterinarians. Uh, and I will say I blew up this chart at the top right so that this is actually a little bit bigger. It doesn't actually match the scale here, but I wanted you to be able to read that. Um, but many of these counties have up to, up to six veterinarians or more in a practice, depending on where they are located. So we see this distribution and it got us to thinking. So one of the things that we actually compared it to, and I don't have it here on this map is, but when we think of cattle density across the state of Kansas, we have a lot of cattle density here if we include all classes of cattle. However, our, that's a different level of veterinary care and oversight than just a local practice. So if we throw in the feed yards, if we look at where the cows are through the state, we have a higher density of cows when we look per acre in the eastern half of the state, which is where we're seeing some of those veterinarians. Now, if we take this map and we say, okay, the average veterinarian, if we drew a 30 mile radius around their practice, how big of an area would that cover and what would our coverage look like? Well, that's exactly what we did. And this is a, a busy chart. It looks like one of those things that you did when you were a kid where you went around and did the circles. But in this case, <coughs> excuse me. In this case, what we see is overlapping areas, especially in the Eastern half of the state. And even in the Western half of the state, there are very few areas that are not covered by a 30 mile radius around each of those practices. I think this is an important uh, thing and a little bit surprising to us, but we've got pretty good coverage across the state for those different veterinary areas. We notice on the Western, especially the Southwestern part of the state, 
there are some areas where there are some gaps and the south central part of the state. Now, we did not, because of the data available to us, we didn't put in veterinarians that potentially lived in Colorado or Oklahoma or Nebraska that might have some overlap with those different areas. But certainly this is an area where we say that might be interesting to follow up. And we're gonna follow up on the Southwest side with uh, what those producers see as potential shortages. So that leads us to kind of the meat of what we wanted to talk about today. And, and here's where I think we've got an opportunity to really dig in. And, and so we said, after looking at those data, we said, okay, what we really wanna know is, is there a shortage of veterinarians? Yes or no? And if so, what's driving that shortage? Because really well defining the problem will allow us to come up with a solution that matches what we need to do. Because when we sat around with this group and this, and this rural workforce development group, and we said, what are some of the things that we can do? We talked about everything from starting at the junior high level to, to get people interested in agriculture or veterinary medicine, all the way up to, should we work with people that have been in practice 25 years and help them better serve their clients? And anywhere in between. We can't go out and do all of those things. We need to figure out, okay, well, is the problem that maybe there are some skills that veterinarians need to develop or some tools that would better serve their client that clients say, hey, I can't get this service or this service or this service, in which case we figure out how we meet that need. Or is it a problem with retention? People start in practice and leave. Is it a problem that's more specific in certain areas of the state? So our goal of doing this survey was to identify, are there specific locations that we see a shortage more than others? Are there specific needs that clients have that are unmet? So I'll set those out to start. And I, and I wanna mention uh, Kristen Smith, who's a grad student of ours. We put together a survey and Kristen really did a lot of the work in putting the survey out. You probably, hopefully, heard of this survey, and I'm sure some of you filled it out, and we appreciate your, your input on the survey. We publicized it pretty widely through KLA, KFB, through the KDA newsletter, through our K-State communications, as well as then there were some independent interviews, and I know several of us did both print and audio or visual interviews. So this was put out pretty widely, and we tried to cast a wide net to get folks to answer some of these questions. And I mentioned our goal of the survey, identify the services or types of services needed and identify where are those service needed. I mentioned that we promoted it quite a bit and we ended up with 202 usable responses. And when I say usable responses, it's, it's relatively common when you take a survey and I have done this, I'm sure others have as well, you get about partway through it and you say, I'm not as interested as I thought I was and you quit. And so you end up with half the answers filled in and half of them not. And we can't use that response because we can't make the same comparisons with the rest of the group. Or you stop halfway and then you go fill it out tomorrow. So one thing I would say, and this would be a great question for this group that's on the call today is we'd love to have more responses. And we posted the survey online. We did not have a, a paper version available, uh, and but it was pretty easy to log in. It was anonymous. You could log in and get there. 202 responses out of all of our producers in Kansas. I would like to see more to have us have a much better feel for where these numbers are, but 202 is enough to give us a starting point and maybe give us an idea of what, we're see what they're seeing in the field. Now I'm gonna leave this, I put these survey questions up just so that you have a feel for what type of questions were asked on this survey. <clears throat> and I'll say most of these survey questions were what I would call close-ended in that they had options. So they didn't just have fill in the blank, they had options and I'll, and I'll show you some of those. But we kept this survey relatively short so it would be easy for a producer to fill out 
and we kept it with information that you would know off the top of your head, right? So you, you put in your best idea of what your answer to these questions are, and it allows us to get a feel. And you'll note that we did collect while the survey was anonymous and confidential, we collected zip code. And then we're gonna go back and we're gonna take that zip code and we're gonna tie it to areas or regions of the state. So our survey respondents, and again, we had 202, <coughs> most of them were cow-calf producers, which is probably what we would expect when we look at our producers that, that are using large animal veterinarians and our producers just in the state, right? Most of our producers would fall into the cow-calf category. If we look nationally, there's about 725,000 cow-calf producers and there's not near as many if we think about the feedlot side or some of the other areas. Most of our producers, uh, almost 90%, had been in their operation for at least 10 years. So we've got uh, producers, that, and I think this is important as we temper the results, and we didn't limit these results in any way, right? We had, uh, we allowed them to put down whatever type of production operation they were in we had an idea that we might go in and break out and say, is there more of a shortage in dairy or equine or some of those other areas? We couldn't really do that due to the low numbers we had there. We also asked them on one of the questions and just kind of describe it. I think it's important to kind of describe the population. We asked them how often a veterinary service was utilized and we're gonna break this out by operation type. And here we lumped together two of our categories. So cow calf, uh, we kept out and the calf grower or feeder we kept out because they had a few more of those and then everything else we put into the other category so that could be uh, horses or or swine or dairy uh, but we kept them out interestingly and a little bit surprising to us we ask how often you use or interact with your veterinarian and we see that there's a fair number of those that are monthly uh, in any of those three categories, which is a little bit surprising on the, especially on the cow-calf side, that you would have a monthly or weekly interaction with your veterinarian. Quarterly or annually makes sense in many operations, but that's what that's what we saw from our from our survey participants. Good, good. Is there a question? Oh, nope. Not a question. An accidental unmute. That's all right. Um, so on our, we also ask based on their location, well, we broke it out by location, but we asked them how far was the nearest large animal vet to their operation? And what we see, and this very well matches the chart that we just looked at. And the chart that we just looked at said uh, in the Northeast, Southeast, in the central part of the, of the state, we certainly saw that there were a lot more veterinarians and what we see Northeast, Southeast, two thirds of the operations, two thirds of the respondents were within 15 miles of veterinary. In the South Central region, it's more of a 40-40 split between less than 15 miles or 15 to 30 miles. As we start to look in the Southwest, we see that there's more of them in that 15 to 30 mile range. Interestingly, as you, as you add it up and you put those two, if we say most veterinarians traveling 30 miles isn't as big of an issue as as you start to go further, certainly it takes more time. Even in the Southwest part of the state, you see about 85% of the people are within 30 miles of their veterinarian. Whereas if you go to the southeast part of the state, it's over 90% that are within 30 miles. So this certainly could play into our shortage scenario. And I'd ask you before I go to the next one, so we have this survey, we ask producers and we ask them, and, and we're gonna spend some time talking through these results, but we ask them, do you think there is a shortage of veterinarians in Kansas? What's your, what's your, what percent do you think said, yes, we think there's a shortage of veterinarians? What we found on our survey 
was almost 60% said, yes, there's a, a veterinary shortage. And I'm gonna show you a series of slides where we kind of break that out. And we're gonna look at it by a couple different characteristics, but I'm gonna keep my colors the same. So if they said, no, there's not a veterinary shortage, that's gonna be highlighted in purple. If they said, yes, they think there's a veterinary shortage, that's gonna be highlighted in, in gray. So, so based on our discussions at previous Ag Summits, this makes sense with what, with what we have heard and that a lot of people are saying there's a, there's a shortage of veterinarians. And so when we ask if you needed more vets and we broke that question out by region of the state, interestingly, there wasn't a big difference by region. Now, certainly the Southwest has a little bit higher number in that it's 62.5%. But look at the other regions of the state, uh, they're in the 50s, 57%, and we have a relatively small number of people that took this survey. Not a huge regional difference. There's still 50 uh, some percent of the people in the Northeast part of the state, 56% that said, yeah, we think there's a shortage of veterinarians. And we just looked at <clears throat> some of the maps and identified that well, there's quite a few veterinarians in those areas of the state. But from, a, from an educator standpoint, as we talk to students and we go out to, to, as they go to areas of state of the state, we want them to go to somewhere that they can be successful. So they have to have the animal base to do that. So I thought this was interesting that there wasn't a big geographic description. I've heard anecdotally, there are certain areas of the state that have a greater need for vets. It's not what our, what our data would say here. We also broke that out and said, do you think there's a greater need for vets or not? And based on how far the vet would travel to their operation. And what we see here, and this is what I, when we start to see a, a meaningful difference between some of these categories, if you were over 30 miles away from a veterinarian, you were more likely to say, yes, we need more vets, yes, there's a, a shortage. If you were less than 30 miles, you still were only around that 50-50, right? You didn't have people, so it's not just proximity to a veterinarian that's making the difference. Certainly, you could say, well, yeah, but if I'm close to the vet, but he's never there, or she's never there, or there's no way to get a hold of them, that certainly does make a difference. But as we look across the scenario, there are people that are relatively close to veterinarians, but they're, but they're not there. So then it makes sense to start to break this down a little bit further. And we say, okay, there's a shortage. Two thirds of the people are saying, or 60% of the people are saying, there is a shortage of veterinarians. So now we wanna find out a little bit more. Okay, so what are we missing? When we don't have these veterinarians, what are the services that we're not getting? Cause we can maybe figure out other ways to provide those services or, work on the training side and say, yeah, we need to have vets better trained in these areas. So we created a list and this list is certainly not comprehensive, but it has 22 items on it. And these were services. And then we're gonna ask a couple questions. We're gonna say, okay, from this list, pick which of these services you use from your veterinarian. And then from this list, pick which service would I like to have but I can't get from my veterinarian, right? In, in theory, if we've got a shortage here, and which is what we just said from above, we can start to find out, okay, what services are we not able to get and where are the problem areas that we need to figure out solutions to? So pretty excited about looking through some of these answers. And, and granted, as I mentioned, it's not comprehensive, but I think we've got a big a broad area and many of these are focused on the cow-calf sign which matches our survey participants so i certainly think we certainly think we have some overlap there and what we found was the top five services that that people use from their veterinarians and it is uh, emergency or sick cow treatment sick individual cow treatment uh, rectal palpation on cows so pregnancy checking breeding soundness exam on bulls, regulatory procedures, or vaccinating animals. 
Now, each of these, remember we had 202 respondents in our survey and you could answer yes, no to each one of these. So these are our top five. So there, there were people that answered yes to some of the other services, but these are our top five that we looked through. And what we see is, and I think it's important to note, uh, almost 160 people said individual animal, sick animal treatment, that's one of the things that we commonly use our veterinarians for. I will, I will provide a, a little bit of perspective to this as well. We polled some of our, so we work with uh, some of our alumni and talk to them about things so that we can use them when training our students. And when we have talked to some of our alumni about what are some of the most important procedures you perform in your practice, both from a practice health standpoint and a beneficial to my client standpoint. The things that we hear from them are pregnancy checking cows, breeding soundness exams on bulls, and then processing calves or processing cows, which would fall under the vaccination category. So what we have is the, the veterinarians over here are saying, these things are good for us and our clients. And the clients are saying, these are the things we use our veterinarians for. That's a, good, that's a good match. So this is when they said, what services do I use from my veterinarian? Now, what services do you think they said, I just can't get this from a vet. So we think there's a shortage. What can I not get from my veterinarian? The emergency animal or sick treatments on individual animals. Was, was the top one. Additionally, balancing rations, evaluating feedstuff, mineral cost, uh, developing reproductive programs, and designing a biosecurity program. So I, I'll, I'll note a couple of things here, and, and I'll say very frankly, this was surprising to me that, the, that these were the answers. Uh, one thing I'll note, and this is the challenge of doing surveys, is we're left afterward to kind of interpret, figure out what, what, is the, what does this mean? One thing I'll note is notice the numbers are much smaller. So we had 60% of the people or 120 or so that said, yes, I have a shortage of veterinarians, but we only had the highest of something they said, I can't get this from a veterinarian was 23. Now, that I think is, is important because it makes it hard for us to say, uh, boy, this is what we should do different. The other thing I'll note is there are some services that aren't on this list. Notably, we talked about preg checking cows, BSEing bulls, vaccinating animals. They didn't make this list. We actually broke this list out. Both these two lists that I just showed you, what services can I get? What services can I not get? We broke those out and we looked at them by people that said, yes, there's a shortage and people that said, no, there's a shortage and the lists don't change. The order doesn't change. So what they put on those lists was not dependent on whether they said there was a, a shortage. So a, a little bit less numbers here. Additionally, some of these things that are on this list, and, and when we first had this discussion with our workforce committee, we talked through some of these things and we said, okay, well, maybe we need some additional training or other things we can do in those areas. Uh, we actually have some training and some electives that would cover each thing on this list. And some of them are, are certainly not exclusive to veterinarians. As we think about balancing rations or evaluating feedstuffs and mineral costs, that's certainly not exclusive to veterinarians. There are, there are many that can help with that area. Uh, the reproductive programs, the biosecurity and the emergency sick animal visits. However, the emergency sick animal visits certainly are an impactful area that we need to be sure to fulfill. So one thing, these are the, this is the list of things that they can't get. Uh, the other side note is I think we have to be sure that these individual uh, items or things listed here, the frequency with which they would occur and the number of clients with which they would occur may be indicated by our relatively low numbers there, in which case it may make it challenging to sustain a practice just if you just wanted to do these items. 
so to kind of wrap things up and and talk through some of the some of the areas that we've covered on this on this survey we and working through with this group in total uh, most respondents that we saw uh, said there was a, a shortage it's about 60 percent of them they said there were relatively frequent veterinary interactions but when we drill down into what's driving that what's driving that shortage or what are the issues there are lots of things that people use veterinarians for and then i now i've just pared this list down to the top three here but then there are three things that uh they're, they're not getting or meeting the needs so uh, i think that was uh, a pretty good shot at what what we've been doing from this rural workforce and we've tried to get together and have lots of different perspectives as we discuss and attack these. And our primary approach was, let's get some data. Let's find out what's actually going on as we drive towards solutions. So we just put together this, the survey was conducted this spring. We just put together the data really in the last few weeks of the survey results. And the committee was just had visibility to that data about a week ago. So we've had some discussion relative to, and, and I think the logical question is, what's the next step? Where do we where do we want to go from here? And how do we how do we continue to, to make progress? We've had some discussions and it's been interesting to look at the actual data of where the veterinarians are and what they're doing, how they're serving those areas. I think some of the things that we pointed out relative to some of the programs, and of course I'm familiar with the programs that are here, there are programs in other states, but some of the programs that we're doing are, are really being quite effective and allowing us to interact with some of those both practitioners and hopefully soon young practitioners as they go through the school process. So trying to develop a good understanding and knowing that as people come through, if I have a much better idea of what this career looks like, I've got a much more likelihood of staying in that career. It's the surprises that get us. So when we look at the retention side, we wanna to try to minimize those. So this committee will continue working forward and we'd be happy to take feedback, input, thoughts, uh, or other areas for potential discussion. Uh, I might've gone a little bit over my time. Oh, I think you were fine, Dr. White. <clears throat> Great information there. Um, and uh, we'll kick it over to Dana. I think there's a couple questions in the chat. So, Dana. Russ, I am going to have to let you look at those because they're not showing up on my chat. So, if you gotcha. want to, I they may have been sent to you directly. With that, which is why I said I don't have one from Amy. <laughs> everybody saw. So anyway, um, you can definitely direct those questions to everyone. You can send them directly to Russ or myself, so we can get those answered. Okay, we've got one here, Dr. White from Amy Hadicheck. Um, so she says, so when examining the top five services available and unavailable, are you saying that the responses were not dependent upon a shortage? Yeah, good, good question. Can I go back to share my screen? So these, and we'll look at the, we'll look at the unavailable ones because I think that's, uh, but it's the same for both. So this is the list from all survey respondents. But if I actually, if we actually go in and we say, okay, these are the top five unavailable services. Uh, and then we break it out and we say, okay, what were the top five unavailable if they answered, yes, there's a shortage. And if they answered, no, there's a shortage, it's the same five, it doesn't change. So, so there really, there was no difference on either these or these services based on whether they said there was a shortage, which is to me surprising. I'm still trying to digest a little bit of exactly what does that mean? That there's no that there's no difference there because my going into it, my theory was okay for for folks. If I think there's a shortage, I've got a reason that I think that, and maybe we didn't ask the right question here or ask it in the right way. 
but what I'm hearing from these data is, yes, I think there's a shortage. And the only thing I can really put my finger on out of these numbers is the emergency sick animal treatment, which I get. I mean, it, it is a it is a real challenge if if we can't if you can't get that accomplished. Did that answer your question, Amy? I think it did, and she'll follow up if the, if she needs more clarity. Um, you know, we did have a kind of a question on the survey itself. Is this something you mentioned earlier? You know, wanting more responses. Is this something that you are thinking the task force is thinking about re? launching is it something that we could maybe try to promote a little more through various networks and even people here on the call yeah i feel like we had a really good uh promotion plan right we worked with the people in communications in k-state in the uh also in the kda through the livestock association through some of the others we had good promotion out there um I think it's important to understand that when we take survey, just think of yourself, you take a survey, somebody says, will you take this survey? Um, oh, well, I'll tell you about me. I'm way more likely to take the survey if I have a strong feeling on the subject, right? If you ask me to take a survey on uh, flavors of ice cream, I may not be as excited about that as I am some other things. But so I, I think, if you ask a voluntary survey rate like that, it may be different. Would it be different if all of us, for example, were sitting in the same room and we passed out the survey and you gave it to an entire population? Now you're based on whoever's in them. So I think, yes, it would be good to get more responses, but I'm not sure that going back and promoting it in the same ways that we have before will be beneficial. We may want to consider some alternative uh, populations or sets of people that we can survey. Dr. White, I want to back up just a little bit to the first question that we had. And you shared a slide that talked about the shortage of services um, that we have. But really, does it boil down to from the question, does the survey show that we have a shortage of vets in Kansas or not? Or do we have a shortage of services available from our veterinarians? <laughs> I think that is, the, that is the question. That's a good question. So what we, so there's a couple ways that we approach this and really shortages, not to be too, too simplistic, are where the demand outstrips the supply, right? So I have a need for something and I cannot get said something. And so I would say it's a shortage. Uh, and all along we've said, let's put some numbers behind this and let's back it up with some data. And what we see when we look at our, our data is we have a pretty good distribution of vets across Kansas. And I'll, let me, hang on a second. Let me zip back up to this slide because I think, I think this is, this is interesting. So when we look at this slide, this, this tells us that if we put a 30 mile radius around each of these practices, now each of these practices may have more than one veterinarian. So you, you can't just say that that's the area that we, we have areas of Kansas that are covered with a lot of density. And we have areas of Kansas that are certainly covered with less density. So there is a difference in the density of veterinarians. This doesn't account for the differences in density of cattle, but there's a difference in density of veterinarians across the state. And then we contrast that a little bit with this that tells us our perceptions of a veterinarian shortage across the state it doesn't really vary by region. So we see there's differing numbers of vets, but we had 60% of people across the board say 55 to 60% say, yes, there's a shortage. So to, to your question, is there a shortage or not, right? That's what we wanted to find out. There is certainly a shortage as reported by our producers that took our survey. However, my caveat, and it's a, to me, it's a relatively big caveat. When we said what services are unavailable, there's, there's not very many on that list. 
So, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that means, and I'm. I'd be interested to see what others think as well. Yeah, and the service unavailable part of them could be done by others, not necessarily the veterinarian that were listed there. And I have a question on the uh, chart that you have up. It came up that South, that North Central is not represented on this um, chart that you have. Where did North Central sit in with these numbers? Uh, that's a good question. And one that I don't have the answer to. Okay. <laughs> so I will have to look that up and get back to you. Okay. Because I don't know why that, uh, boy, no, now I feel bad. There's no North Central folks. Well, I don't know where they went. Good vets, veterinarians up there, but that way before we uh, go forward with any publication, we'll need to make sure that those North Central folks are represented with that. Um, a question came in. So you have your committee, you have your survey, results with it now what um yeah. we be talking to younger veterinarians older veterinarians in kansas to actually get their take maybe do some round table in person um, types of information you know what's the next piece to see if this is actually congruent with those that have boots on the ground yeah, I think that's a I think that's a great question. And our idea going into and and these things have kind of been building on each other, right? So we looked at how many vets are out there, where are the vets, what kind of coverage areas do we have, and then we do this survey and we ask about what are some of the what are some of the need areas, and then our our plan. And I'll just say, you know how these things go and evolve. Our plan was pre-survey, man, when we find out if there's a shortage and people say yes and what services they can't get, then we're gonna figure out how we need to address that. Because I would say uh, some of the things, if we looked at this, if we looked at this list that said, what services can I not get? Some of these items, if they were not in our curriculum, if we weren't covering them in veterinary school, then, then that's part of the solution, right? We gotta learn how to do them. But actually in our core curriculum, we have classes on nutrition, we have classes on reproduction, we have classes on uh, biosecurity, and certainly you, you could argue the whole four years is centered around the top bullet point, right? So it doesn't seem like the results of the survey would drive us to say, let's change our educational program. However, I, I think we, we need to, yes, vet the results of this survey, or maybe vet's a, not the right word, but share the results of the survey with some of our veterinarians and also some of the folks within some of the different groups that are stakeholder organizations that are represented on this committee and find out their thoughts as we go forward. So our plan was identify the problem, go address it. Well, we've identified, yes, there's a, there's a shortage, but we've still got to figure out that next step of what's the best way to address it. Because I don't think a shotgun approach of trying to fix everything all at once is our best plan. Folks have tried that before. I highlighted the VTPRK program because I think it's been very successful, but it impacts five veterinarians a year, right? Five veterinarians a year. So we'd like to be able to have a, a bigger impact. So I think the whoever put the question forward, what's next? That's a great question. And our committee is going to have to digest this a little bit and go back and say, okay, what are the next steps? The one thing I can say for sure is we'll be meeting, discussing, and coming forward with an action plan. I know we're kind of bumping up to our an hour, but we're having some good discussion here and I don't want to cut that short. We did have another question come in. I, I think this one may be better for uh, Dr. Rush. Uh, question of, from your view, you know, after kind of seeing these preliminary results from the survey, kind of what opportunities you see with the College of Vet Med School and programming or any other services? Yeah, and I, I'm glad this slide is up. Um, and as Brad says, this is this is core curriculum, um, and every student encounters these these things. But what I would also say is that the students who are in the specific targeted elective courses, the students that are in the rural scholarship program, the students that are in the food animal certificate program, certainly hit the bottom four topics even harder and um, should be prepared and. If you ask me to, to walk out the door and do one of the things on this list of five, I can do number one. But I went to vet school a little while ago. Um, 
I won't, we won't say what year it was I went to vet school, but I haven't done any of these things since I went to vet school, right? Any of the bottom four. And so I think that's an opportunity for us to target our CE meetings because veterinarians who have been out for maybe five, 10, 15 years might, um, th these might be some really welcome CE topics. I think that's something we wanna ask them before we just launch into it. But I think this data has been helpful in having us understand what might be future for, for CE topics. Thank you, Dr. Rush on that. That actually uh, answered one of the questions that was in the chat, if there was an opportunity for uh, continuing, continuing edu education classes to be offered on those topics uh, for those that may have been out of school for a little bit. So I want to go to the next question, um, Dr. White. Uh, do you think that the idea that producers uh, believe or there's the perception that there's a shortage of veterinarians stems from the perception of having many options to look at individuals that they do other business with? For example, with their, their by their feed, to buy their medications, with all the other options. So does it seem like maybe they don't have as many options for a vet? veterinarian, um, which may come from that, or just the way that we're doing business these days? I think this is a great question. And I don't, I don't know the answer, but that's not going to stop me from speculating. So I think certainly the, as you look at across the board, and the crux of this question is, is it that I'm saying there's a shortage because I don't have options? And when we look at things like, uh, I'm going to go buy milk. I could go buy milk at many different stores in town, and it would be hard to say there's there's going to be a shortage because I have lots of options. I could go here or here or here, and if this store didn't have it, another one would. However, if I have a specific brand of vehicle and I have to go to the dealer to get something serviced, to get a factory recall serviced, I've only got one dealer that I can go to, and if I can't get in, I may say they don't have enough staff, they don't have enough labor. And so I think one of the, there's kind of a, to parse that out a little bit, certainly I think you could be right that it's not just that it is, there's a veterinarian there, but they may not be meeting all the needs that I have, which would go right along with the fact that we had about 50% of the people that said they were within 15 miles of a veterinarian that still said there was a shortage, which this would be a great explanation. And certainly we know, not groundbreaking information, but sometimes personalities don't mesh all that well. So I could live within 15 miles of somebody and that may not be somebody I wanna work or do business with. So it's a little hard to sort out, but I think that's a, I think that's a great question. And it relates to, and I looked at the, the next question that's coming up, Dana, it relates to the uh, reasons why asking about uh, why do they think there's a shortage? And did we ask questions like, do you think your veterinarians charge too much? And we did not. We did not ask about charges. We did not ask about why they wouldn't have used that local veterinarian uh, or why they would have used somebody different. We discussed it, uh, but there was lots of other things. Our initial list of questions was long to keep it short so that we had good responses. So I think it certainly could be potentially a lack of choice. Um, I would also highlight, and we still got this slide up, uh, I would highlight that these are things that veterinarians often do, but may not always promote, but may not always discuss. So it could even be that I say, man, I can't get my vet to design a estrus synchronization program for me, but I've never asked necessarily if that's something they do or want to put me to somewhere else. Dr. Rush, did you want to add in on that? I, I was going to add, answer Carol Fike's question in the chat. Okay. Yeah, the if, question if that's okay. That, yeah, the question that she posed um, is how much difference is there in annual salaries of large animal um, versus mixed practices, vets, and others in Kansas? And how big of a driver might that be on the factor of uh, where we are with large animal vets? And the answer is it's it just shifted pretty recently. So there was a, a time three, four, five years ago where um, food animal salaries were really competitive, 
higher than some of the small animal salaries in say Kansas City or Wichita. With COVID particularly, we saw a big shift this year, but we start, started to see it even before COVID came and it came with a tremendous shortage of small animal veterinarians as well. Uh, there's, there's nobody in the country that will tell you, and in fact, the, the Washington Post just listed veterinary medicine as one of the top seven industry shortages in, in the country. And so there is a shortage in small animal as well. And so the sh small animal salaries in the last two years have eclipsed the mixed animal and food animal salaries in Kansas. Prior to that, uh, the food animal salaries were higher. So the food, the food animal salaries um, should not be creating a problem for us right now uh, in terms of what's available to, to producers, but I'm afraid it might going forward because of the shortage of small animal veterinarians. Well, great. Uh, Rick Tanner, you've raised your hand. Um, did you want to chime in on that? Uh, not particularly on that, but before we left and considering everybody on the call, uh, I just wanted to mention that USDA Veterinary Services will be advertising a position for an animal health technician in Ford or Finney County, Kansas. That should be coming out anytime. So if anybody knows the animal science graduate or anybody in that locale may be looking for work, have them watch usajobs.gov. Uh, Apologize for kind of taking the train off the tracks, but I wanted to take an opportunity to do that. No, that's fine. Thank you very much. That's important information. Dr. Rush, Dr. White, thank you very much. Um, with that, Russ, we'll turn it back to you. Thanks, everyone. Before we take off, I do have a couple of poll questions we want to pop up there. And so I'll ask Robin bloom to pop that first poll question up and this deals with uh, some pretty current topics that has been in, in news and articles related to animal health practitioners so first question is select one of the following that you feel is the biggest issue facing veterinarians today and whether you're a practicing vet or you've got a good relationship with your veterinarian what do you see as some of the major issues that they're dealing with so mental health issues in the medical profession work-life balancing, balancing veterinary practices, animal welfare, educating the public, uh, professional development, and then the number of large animal practitioners in the state. So we've still got 27 on the call. And uh, Robin, when you see that number get up around in the 20s there, we can go ahead and take that down. Yeah, I would imagine most have had a chance for that. So Robin, what's the results look like? And not surprisingly, I think a little bit of everything, especially during COVID, we've all struggled with that work-life balance issue sometimes. So 72% and looks like uh, mental health issues and number of large animal practitioners in the state come in there at second. So appreciate you guys taking that one. And the last poll question deals with our uh, outcomes and objectives for the animal health sector. So these are the outcomes and objectives that we've coll collected over the past five, six years. And so each year we try to update those as what may be the thing that the sector really needs to focus on. So select one of those four outcomes that you feel is probably the most important or the most pressing at this time that the industry should be focusing on. I'll give you some time. Some of those are a little wordy, so I'll give you a little bit of time to read through those. Okay, Robin, I 
We probably should have had enough time to read through those. If you think we've got enough there, go ahead and pop the results up. And it looks like 47% continued industry-led proactive social and traditional media outreach with consumers and influencers. So pretty hot topic there, as well as looks like the livestock industry that's prepared to respond to an animal disease event there in second place. So appreciate that response to that. And those are the types of issues that we'll bring back to the industry itself when we collect together and with our collaborators and engagement and work toward addressing some of those issues. So with that, that kind of brings us to the end of the session. I do wanna thank everyone for taking time on your lunch hour. I know we ran over just a little bit and a special thanks to Dr. Rush and Dr. White for being a part of this and presenting that information on both College of Vet Med as well as that survey. Um, wanna remind you this has been recorded and will be available on our website either later this week or early next week. And don't forget to join us in Manhattan in person on August 26th for the In-Person Ag Growth Summit, where there will be a social the evening before, so on the 25th. That registration site is available at agriculture.ks.gov slash summit. So make sure and register to be in person. Uh, also, this is the second year for our Heroes in Agriculture. So we want to encourage you to nominate somebody that you feel has provided a notable contribution to the Kansas ag industry or their community over this past year. So that website is available on your screen, agriculture.ks.gov slash ag heroes. So nominations are open until August 13th. So please nominate somebody for that. With that, we are done. Again, thank you all for taking time and have a great afternoon.